in 1860, the word veterinarian was a little bit too long for people to say. And so they abbreviated it to vet. That was a person who would take care of your animals. Let's call the vet. They want to say veterinarian. 30 years later, that noun became a verb. It was still connected with taking care of animals, but it was connected with somebody doing some action in a horse race. All of a sudden, we had the verb to vet. We know it to be now that we're going to examine. We're going to look into someone's life. We're going to look at their characteristics before we appoint them to a particular office. Maybe a candidate for president. We need to vet them before we elect them. And that what is what has occurred. In time, and we see it in our business world, but usually in the business world, we're going to have a professional that's involved in vetting. They may take a financial statement or they may take a contract or proposal for business, and they will begin to have their lawyer look over that. They will vet that document until he releases it and says, it's clear, you can sign on the bottom line. Or there may be a trained physician on the sidelines that is taken in to a tent, uh, an athlete, and he's going to begin to examine him, and finally he will give the clearance for that athlete who has been under concussion protocol and give him the clearance to play next week. Professionals doing the vetting. But when it comes down to the Lord's church, there is some vetting that takes place before we choose our elders. Our future elders are to be vetted, but they won't be vetted by a bunch of professionals. That's you and me in a congregation that examines them, looks at their abilities, recognizes things about them that are according to the Word of God, and we vet those men who are involved in serving as elders. The Bible teaches that. And we'll see this morning the answer to three questions. How do I know if that man will be a good leader as an elder in the church? What do I examine about him? Where do I look? This congregation at Parkview, we have elders. And it's a wonderful time to be able to think about this subject without the idea, well, we got to choose one tomorrow. We've got to be looking at them now. No, we don't have to do that. We have elders. They're good men, qualified men, doing their work as shepherds and bishops and men of age who are serving as elders. And we may think, I don't think they could ever be replaced. Oh, we honor them. And there may be some people in your life that are just indispensable, but it's been said more than once that the graveyard is full of indispensable men. And that is true. Someone's going to have to take their place. And when we begin to think that I am invincible, you better be glad you don't get to wake up in the middle of a graveyard and see who took your place. It will happen. But will those men be qualified? We've got to vet our future elders. And so we begin by looking at, well, how are we going to vet them? Well, we're going to look as we see who would be a good leader. How do we know that? By examining someone. How can we pay attention to to if they're going to be a good leader. Well, how do they relate to the Word of God that's been revealed? See, they have to because of 1 Timothy 3 and verse 2, a very short statement, but they have to be apt to teach. 
apt to teach. They must have the ability to impart information that another person can understand. And they must possess that ability. You know, when you just read the Word of God, it teaches. When the words are spoken, they teach. Because Jesus went up into a mountain, and when, his, when he sat down, the disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He just spoke words. But when you read those words, it's teaching something. I'm sitting here listening to that first verse which said, how could you ever think of poverty being blessed? Blessed are the poor in spirit. The Greek hearer would hear that say, that doesn't mean they have a little bit of money in their pocket. It is an abject poverty person. It is a person that doesn't have a thing. How could that ever be blessed? And how could a poor person ever have the kingdom? That's an oxymoron. Blessed is a poor person. They don't go together. Poor people begin to possess the kingdom. And what about that verse 10 when he finished reading that section and he's getting down to the persecution part? He says, blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake. How could a persecuted person ever be blessed? It's doing a lot of teaching. We're asking a lot of questions just to hear the words that are set forth. But words that are spoken, he taught them. I don't know if he went into a lot of detail, but when he spoke those words, he was teaching. Not only when they're spoken, but when concepts are grasped, teaching occurs. Psalm 1 and verse 1, blessed is the man. And he does not go away the counsel of the ungodly. He's not going that way. He doesn't stand in the path of sinners. He does not sit at the seat of scorners. And when you read that, you begin to say, how come he says counselors and talks about a way with counselors? I can see two people getting together and they're making a plan. They're giving counsel. And this third guy comes along and says, I want you to go that way. You go that way of our counsel. Maybe you robbed a bank. Don't go the way of the counselor, because they're telling you to go a wrong way. We always know that the path of the sinner, he misses the mark every time he walks that way. Why do you stand in that path? It's going to end up the wrong way. Don't stand in the path of the sinner. Oh, how easy it is to make fun when you've got everybody sitting on your side and making fun of somebody. You're sitting at the seat of the scornful. Making fun of God, it sounds real good when you've got a group together. Just sit down and talk and, and make scorn of, of, of what is good. Don't sit with them. But i tell you what your delight is in. It's in the law of the Lord. And in his testimonies doth thou meditate day and night. That's the counsel you go to. That's the pathway that you follow. Because you delight in the very word of God. Those are some concepts that come through teaching. And when concepts are grasped, teaching occurs. Not only words spoken, concepts grasped, but when doctrine is applied, teaching occurs. Just look at the list of the sins in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 10. He speaks about fornicators. He, he speaks about homosexuals, abusers of themselves with men. He speaks about men stealers, those who would steal people and bring them in to slavery opposed upon them. What about men who are involved as being a liar? What about those who promise and do not fulfill their promises? You've got sexual sins. You've got people lying with the tongue. You've got people that are stealing and kidnapping people. And one verse, you've got some sins there. It is contrary to what? Contrary to what? Well, I, I'm going to apply something. 
and I'm going to apply it to the sound doctrine that comes from the blessed gospel of God. That's the standard, and it affects all facets of your life. And you're applying it to your life. There's some people that keep telling lies that don't apply the word to their life. There's no godly sorrow to repent. And that word is standing them and facing them in the judgment day. Word of God is applied. That's when you really learn. And it changes your life. A man's ability to teach the word of God is what we began to look at, to see the importance of that. And we notice something about his life. He's holding forth to the faithful word, which is according to the teaching that he may both exhort with that sound doctrine. And he can convict that false teacher is this out for self-gain, the gainsayer. And that's application of his word. And that becomes very important. What do you hold to? You hold to something that is very special to you. Oh, you can know the scripture, you can quote the scripture, but do you hold to the scripture? And we look at men who are going to the scriptures and they're holding fast because it is a faithful word. Sound like we're speaking about a man who learned a long time ago that when he came out of the world and became a Christian, he had the renewing of his mind. And he could acknowledge with that information that changed his mind and changed his life, what is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God. And he has been faithful to him ever since. He holds to it. Because he knows how faithful it is. Do we see a man going to that when he's instructing others about maybe how they ought to live their life? Or does he go to his opinions of how he lives? What he's learned on the side? Oh, he may have a lot of wisdom and there's no reason to go through life and not be wise. And there's a lot of things we can gain from that, but do they go to the Word of God? How often do you see that taking place? I need to be vetting that. I need to be watching that as men come, come of age. And then they have the ability to exhort. Here's the word of God. I found it to always be faithful. It's kind of like a gunslinger. I got old faithful by my side. He's relied on it many a time. That sword is the sword that's faithful. I'll tell you what, it can help you with your life. And you can also convict those who contradict that word. And the reason you will busy yourself in doing that because that word is so special. It's the word of God. And it's always been faithful. So what are you looking at? You're looking at a man who goes to the word of God and applies that to his own life. And he's able to exhort and to convict with that word, not his opinions, but that word. We're not looking for a public speaker that is proficient. We're not looking at a man that, well, he doesn't do much uh, public speaking. But we're looking at someone who may be able to impart instruction at a dinner table or a dining room table. And he's very effective one-on-one. -on -one. Is that man qualified with you? We're looking at someone that can teach. And I just say to young men of our congregation that we're going to need elders down the road. Indispensable men die. And one of the greatest things that you can be involved in doing is starting at a young age to know the book, to know the Word of God. 
and to busy yourself and striving to teach others when opportunities come for you to maybe teach a class. Oh, it's a lot of work, a lot of preparation, but you do that. Because you know what is going to happen one day? We're going to be needing elders, and one of the qualifications, he that desire the office of a bishop, desireth a good work. And if all of a sudden you say, I like that job, I like that work, because people have vetted you and saw that you've been teaching that word, you've been following that word, you've been trying to teach that to others, that all of a sudden that will go along with your desire and realize you're here to serve, not get on an ego trip, that I'm a leader of this congregation. It'll go a long way in determining, is this man wanting to serve? Does he just want an office? We have vet a man's ability to teach the word. Secondly, we're going to vet a man's reputation. What do I examine? I examine his reputation. When you think of a reputation, we're thinking about what's the general ideal about this man's life? What is the, the general consensus? How do you view that man? How do you sum up that man's life? Is he a good man? Bad man? Reputation. And the Bible teaches us that we must examine that. I tell you, his reputation should be blameless. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 2, in Titus 1 and verse 6, you find two different Greek words that are dealing with this point about being blameless. 1 Timothy 3, 2 is the fact you can't lay hold on him with, all, with, with, the, with something against him. It won't stick. Oh, people can tell lies, but it won't stick. You can't lay hold of him with that reproach. In fact, you can't even call it into question, his character. That's the vetting that must take place. That's the qualification that they must have before they serve as elders. And when you think about that, as the New American Standard says, it is above reproach. You can't call into question his character and not can't lay hold of him, those things. It's above reproach. That's how a Christian ought to be living. And that becomes something a part of the reputation. But not only that among ourselves, but he's to have a good report among non-Christians as well. 1 Timothy 3, 7. Must have a good report from them that are without. Oh, we might think another congregation. Okay, we're all God's people. He needs to have a good report among all Christians in the community. But sometimes that without is dealing with the fact of not members of the church. Now we're looking at the reputation that the man has in the community. And that's important to God. And that should be important to us. Think of the blessing of the work of evangelism. That you're striving to teach other people the gospel and they come to church one day. And they see a person that they know. And what makes it a blessing is that they know this person is a godly person. This person is striving to live the life of a Christian. I see that in their life. I just didn't know where they went to church. What a powerful help that is when they see someone they know other places and they know they're living as a Christian, how bad it is. How an evangelistic effort can soon be curtailed because they bring in, we bring in somebody and they see that person, I know them. They call themselves Christians. I see a different person. And it is particularly devastating when that person is an elder of a local church. Evangelism can get curtailed real quick. There'll be advancements there. 
because we can have hypocrites fill the vacancy of elderships. Reputation is important. And a reputation is something from within and without. That young men, you need to develop early in your life. You're getting a reputation, whether you like it or not. And the question is, how will you be perceived? See, it takes a long time to develop a good reputation. It only takes a moment to destroy it. it. Only takes a moment. Guard it. Protect it by godly living. Just break it down to each day. You've got choices to make. You've got decisions that you're going to make. You're going to go a certain way. You've got to make choices and all those things. And you build your day in those choices that you choose a way that's godly. You choose a way that's right. And day by day, you make those choices, you live that life. And one day, all of that daily living will be vetted in blameless reputation by the church that's looking for elders. You've been vetted and you're blameless. You're above reproach. You guard it and you build it and you sustain it even in the world out there because I tell you that a good example, a good example is essential for a healthy flock of Christians. And it is a great help to the world that maybe one at a time is deciding to come out of the world and change their life and to become a Christian. What a healthy example that is. When somebody you know can attest that man has a good reputation and how devastated it is when it's not there. Man's ability to teach, a man's reputation, man's ability to teach and to connect with that word is telling us, well, that might make a good leader one day. What do I examine? I examine his reputation. Thirdly, where do I look? Where do we look? The Bible invites us to look at a man's home. To look at his family. To look how he leads his home. And in regard to elders, that's very important. First of all, he is to be the husband of one wife. He follows the Lord and his marriage law. In Ephesians 5, 23, we're to love his own wife. Oh, there were times for people having many wives in the first century. They had concubines on the side. Society was allowing that. We read about it in the Old Testament. But under the New Covenant, and following the teachings of Jesus Christ, we find, no, oh, he is a, a one-woman man, literally. He's the husband of one wife. He's not a polygamist. He doesn't have a bunch of concubines. Matthew 19, 9, you're not to divorce, but you can for the cause of fornication. He's been scripturally divorced, maybe, but he still has one wife. Well, he remarried, he still has one wife. He has one woman and his wife. And he's following in his home. The building block is according to the teachings of God. We look how he rules in that household. How he governs. Does he take care of his family? Is he a hard worker? 
Does he provide for them? Does he protect them? Does he assist them in the things that they need? We can see that, and we can see it's not happening. He rules well his household. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 4. <laughs> Suddenly you get a reputation, don't you? Not when you do right. And where we look is in that family relationship. And God says, I want you to vet your future elders. Is he following the teachings of the word as far as his marriage is concerned? Does he assist and protect his family? What about those children? In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 4, we read that they're in subjection. And that could be a lot of reasons for accomplishing that. But the Holy Spirit adds something to that. It's not that they're just in subjection. But they are doing that with all gravity. The American Standard Version has it. That means reverence. Seriousness. And we begin to realize, are the children under control? Yeah. But is it because they reverence their father? That's the way it's supposed to be. Because the father has been giving some discipline if he has the children like that. Proverbs 13, 24, he that spareth the rod hates his son. Did you hear that? He that spares the rod withholds discipline, hates his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Often, when it's needed, consistently. Discipline is very important in the home. Chasten thy children, chasten thy son, seeing there is hope. Proverbs 19 and verse 18. Seeing there is hope. Do not set your heart on his destruction. I just won't discipline him. I'll let him go. It's easier that way. Too much trouble, too tired. <clears throat> no, a loving father has to set forth the discipline. But see, they're in subjection, but not because they've got an abusive father who lays down the law that doesn't really apply the discipline with love. He's got them under control, but not with gravity, not with reverence. That's not your leader. That's your dictator. And you don't want that in the eldership. So what you do, you observe the family. Is he applied discipline? And you know what? Every one of us has been raised by godly parents. You may have thought you're going to die when you're punished. Never doubt it. Somebody loved me. He loved me enough to discipline me. We know that. And we know abuse too. Bible says that we're the fathers or we to be involved in raising our children without bringing forth wrath that to them is like they're disparaging wrath. It's just like, I can't please the guy. I can't please her. I can't please my daddy. And he's ruthless. And what he does in his discipline is ruined, but you don't have reverence for it. And there is a difference there, and God says that it's to be with gravity and reverence. It's voluntarily submitting to his headship and discipline because it's been applied with love. And then you look at those children. Are they faithful? Titus 1 and verse 6, we see that as Timothy looks at the character of the father in 
raising the children in discipline. Now we look at the character of the children themselves. And he says, the husband of one wife having children that believe who are not accused of riot or unruly. American Standard Version. Children that believe. Does that mean that they are reached the age of being a Christian? Or is that being faithful to the Father that they reverence? Different ideas about that. But when God, through the Holy Spirit, addressed the saints in Ephesus, he addressed it to the faithful. That was a description of what a Christian is. He addressed it to the faithful. And here is the leadership of a father who is disciplined and trained to go a certain way, who is holding fast to the faithful word and able to instruct others. Does he have children that are Christians, that are being faithful to the Lord? I think that's what we see here. I think we need to not overlook that. And then, what life are they living? Are they the fellow out here as a teenager that goes out and gets drunk and gets wasted on the weekend? No, he's, he's not... He's not into dissipation and the fact that he has no control over his passions. He's been disciplined. He is not involved in, in going that route. He is not unruly. He is submitting to the authority of that father. Yes, they're faithful to a father, but I think he's led them to be faithful as Christians. Isn't that what we're trying to do to bring Christians out of the world? We're to be people in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 that we've been called out of darkness into light. And that we're to be holy as God is holy. Peter 1 verse 15. That's the life we're living. Our elders are that way. They're not hypocrites. They have been vetted for their reputation. But here we look at their home. And I think we see faithful children of God, not only faithful to their physical father but to the Lord and they're living that life as well not giving over and wasted in their passions and they're not unruly what they've learned to do is to be self-controlled because they've been disciplined to take over and be self-controlled and they're not worrying what they're going to do on the weekend and the world sees that and we can observe that. Children are faithful. And indeed they are, I think, faithful Christians. Those are the three areas. Part two will be tonight. But when we vet our future elders, how do they use the word? Do they go to it continuously of how they ought to direct their own lives and the lives of others? Are they able to communicate that word to others? Are they willing to stand up and defend the truth, the doctrine of Christ? Convict a gainsayer, put it into their conscience because you've got the word and you apply it that way. And you exhort the people, this is the route we ought to go. I'm going that way, you need to follow me. We're shepherds, aren't we, when you serve as an elder? How do they use the word? Are they efficient in that? Are they applying themselves in that? Are they apt to teach? That's important. What do I examine? Examine his reputation. We have a view of his character. What are those outside the world? How do they view him? Have you observed that in your life? As you associated with that person in a context of other people, been to parties and Gatherings that involve people in the world. I do. I find people all the time like that. What are they, how do they react? Do people feel in the world real comfortable with them? Are they surprised to know that that person is a Christian? 
How do I know one will be a good leader? I might see how he, his close association is with the Word of God, how able he is to apply it in his life and the life of others. And I'll be examining his reputation, and I'll be looking at his family, his reputation in his home. Is he a husband of one wife? Is he taking care of their needs? Is he disciplined in love, his children, and they manifest that in their reverence to their father? Have they learned to be self-controlled in their own lives? That's what we do when we look at the elders. And how do we know? Where, what do we examine? Where do we look? Tonight we'll look definitely at more things about his character as we continue our study of vetting our future elders. This morning, if you're not a child of God, we encourage you to think seriously about your soul. We talk about indispensable men, they die, we all die. <laughs> and your soul is precious. Jesus died for it. So you can be saved from your sins if you've never responded to Jesus. Think soberly about that. He is the only way that we can go to heaven and see the Father one day. I am the way, the truth, and life, and no one cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said that. You can trust in him. In John 14 and verse 6. We must come to him on the conditions that he sets forth. Godly sorrow ought to work in your heart that says, I will turn from my sins, but I still got them. I'm going to be buried into the death of Christ in baptism because I confess that he is the Son of God. I'm turning from my sins, and I'm going to be baptized for the remission of my sins. And you'll be raised to walk in the newness of life. We're here to assist you so you can obey that word, so you can hold fast to it. Because I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it is a faithful word. It will never let you down. Obey it as we stand and as we sing.